Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. But for those of you who haven't, I haven't met or for who don't recognize me when I'm not singing, my name is Aria. I'm the worship pastor here and I'm just so excited to be sharing the word today. If you were here last week, we heard from Chaplain Guy from the Air Force Base who shared a powerful word. If you haven't had a chance to hear it, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it. But he shared about public victories and private battles which segues perfectly into this morning's message. The message I feel like the Lord put on my heart is to talk about how we should respond when those battles come our way. So what comes to your mind when you hear the word battle? You might think of the song that we sang earlier, The Battle Belongs. You might think of a military struggle, Civil War, Revolu Revolutionary War. You might picture a scene from a movie. We've all seen those movies, whether it be a, a superhero movie or a war movie, where we get to the end and they have that last victorious battle against the enemy with the epic music. It might be um, an, a story from the Old Testament, like our passage that we'll be reading from today. And if you've grown up in church, you might have heard the word battle in reference to a trial you're facing or the struggles that we encounter. We may not face physical battles like they did with an army up against us, but how many of you have faced something that felt like a battle? When you were up against something that felt beyond your ability to handle, you felt like you were surrounded on all sides or you're facing an enemy because the reality is that we still face battles today. We may not have a whole physical army against us, but we do have an enemy, the enemy of our souls. It says in 1 Peter 5, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. We have a very real enemy who will do anything he can to keep you from God. And sometimes he will stir up battles and, and bring us battles that we face, whether it be emotional or spiritual or physical. And then there are other times when we face battles that are caused by our own choices. The truth is that we were never promised an easy life. We weren't promised that once we came to know Jesus, all of our problems would be gone. In fact, we were promised the exact opposite. Countless times in scripture, we see verses about taking up your cross, laying down our lives, spiritual warfare, persecution for what we believe. It says in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Yes, we will face battles. Your Christian walk will not be free of hardship, but we don't walk alone. We have our God who is with us and fighting for us. And ultimately, as we're about to read and as we sang this morning, the battle belongs to him, amen? So this morning, we're gonna look at a story in the Old Testament where a king and a kingdom, they're faced with an insurmountable battle. And in their response to that situation, I believe we can draw some relevant principles of what we can do when we face our own battles. So you can go ahead and open up your Bible or scroll to 2 Chronicles 20. It'll also be on the screen for you. For time's sake, we'll be skipping through our passage a little bit. Just a little bit of context as you open up your Bibles. The people of God in the Old Testament were the Israelites. They went through many different phases of leadership. They had prophets, judges, but eventually they asked God for a king. So God gives them King Saul, who is later succeeded by King David, who we know the psalmist. King David's reign is really the peak of the kingdom of Israel. Um, he was a godly king. He was a man after God's own heart and God blessed his reign. But after King David's reign, things really begin to go downhill. Um, we even see that the, the nation of Israel is divided into two separate kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. And so the, the books of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, where we're reading from today, they tell the story of all the kings, good and bad, until eventually the entire nation of Israel is taken into exile. Where we pick up in Second Chronicles, we're reading about the reign of King Jehoshaphat, who was the king of Judah. 
And Jehoshaphat is one of the few kings who served the Lord. And because he was faithful to the Lord, God blessed his reign. It says he became very wealthy and highly esteemed. He put a stop to a lot of the idol worship that was happening in, in the kingdom. And he educated people on the word of God. He was a godly king. And our story starts in chapter 20, where we find King Jehoshaphat and the kingdom of Judah faced with a battle. So right at the beginning of this chapter, we see that not just one nation, but three of Judah's neighbors are joining forces and declaring war on them. And not only does Jehoshaphat discover that they are all coming for them, by the time he finds out that they're coming, they are already very close. After doing some research, we can guess that they were probably about a day's walk away. So we start our story in verse three. It says, alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. So since Jehoshaphat was a godly king, the first thing he did when he heard the news was to turn to the Lord. So he gathers the entire nation. They all gather together and they begin to fast and they begin to pray. And in verse six, this is their prayer. Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations, Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and we'll cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. So he's appealing to the might and the power of God. They're remembering his faithfulness to bring them to that land and provide a way. And basically he's saying, if you brought us here, if you provided a way for us to come here and gave us this land, we know that you're big enough to help us keep it. So he continues in verse 10. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they were paying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I love how he ends this prayer. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Then as they continue to pray, the spirit of the Lord comes upon a man named Jehaziel to speak to the people and he says, listen King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. What a powerful word from God. And so after they receive this word from the Lord, they all begin to worship together. They begin to, begin to praise the Lord for what he said, for what he's promised them. And then they begin to prepare for the battle. And we continue in verse 21. It says, after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. So they're obeying the Lord. They're going out to face the army. They're trusting in the promise that that he will deliver them. And what they decide to do is so significant. Jehoshaphat gathers his army, and instead of putting the strongest fighters in the front, instead of relying on correct battle strategy, he puts the singers in the front to worship the Lord. I bet every singer suddenly had a sore throat that morning. (laughs) I know I would. Suddenly I'm gonna ask a lot more details before I admit I can sing for anything. (laughs) But it's so significant because they're putting action to their faith. You don't put musicians at the front of the army if you think you're actually going to fight. That's not going to end well. But they had faith that God would do what he said he would do. So it continues. 
As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab at Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Mount Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. Can you imagine? I just picture this like a movie playing out. They're making their way to the battle. They're bracing themselves for what's ahead. They're just clinging to their faith in the Lord. And they suddenly get to this lookout point where they expect to see their enemies just as far as I can see. But instead, what they see is their enemy already defeated. They didn't even have to lift their swords. Just as the Lord had said, they did not have to fight. And so later they gather up all the plunder, they come back to the valley, and it says they praise the Lord for the victory that he had given them. We may not fight physical battles like they did where we have an entire army coming up against us, but how many of you know that we still fight battles today? We know that battles will come, so what do we do when it does? I believe King Jehoshaphat and Judah's response gives us a great example of what to do when we face the battles of life. So we're gonna look at four principles, four things that we should do when the battle comes. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for what you've already started in this place. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to lift up your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you, God, that the battle belongs to you, Lord. So teach us what to do when we are faced with those battles. Teach us the correct response. Lord, we open up our hearts to your word today. Would you speak to us through it? Thank you for your word. Lord, I only want to say what you want me to say, Lord. Help me to speak your words today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So what do we do when the battle comes? If you're taking notes, which I would encourage you to do, our first point is we inquire of the Lord. It says in verse three, alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. Jehoshaphat resolves to inquire of the Lord. And from our passage, it seems as though this is his first response. He immediately turned to God. And this is a king with a huge army who has been successful in battle. He could have called the battle strategists, his advisors, his strongest military leaders, and I'm sure that he did, but our passage says that the first thing he did was inquire of the Lord. He does the same thing in the chapters prior. In chapter 18, he's faced with another battle. He teams up with another king, and before they strategize or plan anything, he stops, and he says, first, let's find out what the Lord says. God was his go-to, his first choice. It wasn't his backup plan, it was the plan. And not only did Jehoshaphat turn to the Lord, he was determined that everybody turned to the Lord. He proclaims a fast for all of Judah and they all gather together to pray. To inquire means to seek information by questioning. So when we inquire of the Lord, we're asking him for guidance. We're getting his take on the situation. We're bringing our battle before him and we're saying, Lord, what what do you want me to do? What should I do? What's my next step? In the New Living Translation, it, it says of our passage, Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. We see all throughout the Old Testament that godly leaders took time to inquire of the Lord before they did anything. And when they didn't, it usually didn't go well for them. It says in 1 and 2 Samuel, the phrase, David inquired of the Lord nine different times. But when he didn't inquire of the Lord, he fell into sin with Bathsheba. When Joshua, leading the people of Israel, didn't inquire of the Lord before the battle, they were defeated in that battle. So what is our response when the battle comes? When we get difficult news, when we're faced with something that's beyond our ability to handle, where do we turn? I know my first response is not always the correct response. We tend to turn to other people, a friend, a spouse. We turn to entertainment, anything that can distract us from our current reality. Sometimes we turn to things like food and alcohol, but often inquiring of the Lord is our last resort. And the harsh reality is that anything that we turn to before we turn to the Lord is an idol, even if it's a good thing. Our first response tends to be that we either try to escape the problem or we run to others to talk about the problem. 
But what if we prayed about it as much as we talked to other people about it? What if we actually brought it to the one who can do something about it? This isn't easy, but our first response has to be to inquire of the Lord. Now, obviously, talking to your spouse, confiding in a friend, getting advice from a trusted mentor, those are all good things, and we should do them too, but not as a substitute to bringing it to the Lord, and not before we bring it to the Lord. Ask him. Amen. <laughs> Ask him. He has all the answers. Why do we try to figure it out on our own when we have direct access to the one who created the universe? He's all-knowing. He knows our entire journey before we even take a step. I think it's so interesting that, that when we're children, when we're kids, what do we do when something happens? What do we do when we're faced with something and we just don't know the answer? We go to our parents or a trusted adult figure. We go to the person who has the answer. We weren't afraid. We weren't ashamed of our lack of knowledge. But then as we get older, somehow we're subconsciously taught that we should know better. We feel like we should already have the answer, so we don't want to ask. But that's not how it is with the Lord. He knows you don't have the answer. He designed it that way so that you would come to him. Sometimes we don't have the answers simply because we don't ask. And it can be so easy to say, I don't have to tell him, he already knows. And it's true, he does know. He knows before we even say a word, but we need to take intentional time to inquire of the Lord. Take deliberate time in prayer to bring your battle to him. He will guide you. He will tell you what to do. But be aware that sometimes his guidance will be silence. <laughs> sometimes silence means not yet. Sometimes it means keep walking until I make the way clear. When the time is right, he will direct you. And it might not be through a spoken word. It might be through a door closing, an opportunity presenting itself. There's something that happens, the way that the Lord directs you and guides you might be something really normal. We tend to over-spiritualize things sometimes. We're waiting for that dove to descend upon us as we're walking in the right direction. And it's not that God doesn't work in big dramatic ways. He can and he does. But sometimes we miss the very normal ways that God is leading us and directing us because we're looking for a big spiritual sign. When I first came to Calvary, um, I was interviewing for the position. It was my first time in Dover. Some of the staff was showing me around. They showed me Trace Sorrell and the racetrack and the, the Dover Mall. If the Dover Mall wasn't gonna get me to come to Dover, I don't know what would, but. <laughs> It was an extensive tour. And so the whole weekend, um, we were kind of just joking. At one point, we saw a rainbow. And I remember they said, oh my goodness, that's, that's the same direction of Calvary. That rainbow is over Calvary right now. That's your sign. And we joked about it. And all weekend, and every little thing would be like, ah, oh, that's a sign. You're supposed to say yes. But the reality was that I loved the people. I loved the vision. I felt peace. And I felt like this was a place I could be. And that was the Lord's direction in such a normal, normal thing. He said, this is where I was supposed to be. So let us not miss his direction and let us not forget to inquire of him because we're just looking for some big miraculous sign. He wants to direct you. He wants to speak to you, even in the mundane. So when the battle comes, inquire of the Lord. Let it be our first response. So what do we do when the battle comes? We inquire of the Lord. And number two, we admit our need. One of my favorite verses in our passage today is verse 12, where Jehoshaphat is inquiring of the Lord and, and he's seeking him and he's really just laying it all out on the table. He says, for we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. He says, for we have no power to face this vast army. He's basically saying, if you don't come through, we're dead. <laughs> have you ever felt like this? I know I have. I have said that prayer so many times. Lord, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. But this is the king of Judah speaking, admitting his need. He admits in a prayer in front of all of Judah that he doesn't know what to do. What humility to admit our need, we have to lay down our pride. And this is hard. 
If you're anything like me, I like to feel like I have it all together. I want to prove that I'm strong enough to handle it. I will carry all of my groceries in one trip and no, I do not need help. <laughs> Which how many of you know that's never true, you know? Especially when you live on the third floor like I did for the longest time. <laughs> When my husband and I were dating and newly married, I was stubbornly independent. I like to say I've gotten better, which is why I say was. You have to ask him himself for that. But I used to insist upon doing things myself. And one of the things for some reason I insisted upon doing was carrying heavy things. And I'm not one of those people that will pretend to be too weak to carry something just because I don't want to. I am just generally not a very strong person. But I would, for some reason, insist upon carrying whatever it may be. And Tim would look at me and say so many times, let me help you. He said it to me so many times. And that's a silly example, but that's what God is saying to us so many times. We're struggling and we're trying to carry it all on our own and, and face this battle and figure it out. And he's there just saying, let me help you. Give it to me. Admit that you can't do it on your own. We have to lay down our pride and admit our need because he responds to humble hearts. What's also interesting to me are the circumstances surrounding the situation. Jehoshaphat had a huge army. It says in the preceding chapters that King Jehoshaphat was powerful. He had great wealth, probably a lot of allies, lots of resources. But by the time he finds out that their enemy is on their doorstep, it's probably too late for him to call upon anyone else. The army is literally a day's march away from them. So there's not even much time for him to prepare his own troops and even if they did have the time and the opportunity to call on their allies, they weren't just facing one army, they were facing three armies together. The odds were not favorable, they were outnumbered, and they were out of time. And I think that God let it happen this way on purpose. And I just wanna stop and make something clear right now. God is not against you. He will not harm you. He will not inflict pain and suffering upon you. But there are times that he will allow battles to come into our lives, to teach us something, to draw us closer to him. And sometimes we won't understand why until way down the line. But he has a purpose. And I think that's what he did here. He, he brought them to the end of their resources so that their only option was to trust in him. You know what happens when you cling to your pride and you insist that you can handle on your own? He shows you that you can't. And it's usually not fun. He loves when we get to the end of ourselves because that's when he does his best work. Paul understood this concept. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10, but the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And this has been my life first. This has been the story of my walk with the Lord. Him bringing me to situations and allowing battles to come into my life that I just can't handle in my own strength, trying to break my stubbornness. And he brings me to things that I'm not qualified for so that I have to rely on him. Um, even what I'm doing now, I was a shy kid. <laughs> my parents were also worship leaders and they had to pay me to come sing with them when I was little. And that sometimes didn't even work. I wanted nothing to do with it. I stopped asking for birthday parties when I was little because I didn't like the attention of having everyone there for me. <laughs> I didn't want to be on a stage. And even after I eventually started leading worship, singing and speaking are two very different things. At least when you're singing, you're singing someone else's words, so you're pretty safe. But when you're talking, who knows what heretical things could come out of your mouth accidentally. So when I felt the Lord calling me into ministry, I faced a huge battle with my insecurity, with my lack of ability. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe that's your battle. Maybe your battle is with insecurity or fear. Maybe the Lord has brought you to a situation where you're saying, I'm not qualified to handle this. And you're battling insecurity and fear. But when he brought me to the end of my ability, he stepped in with his 
And he did so much more in his ability than I ever could have done in my own strength. He will allow us to face battles we cannot handle in our own strength because it forces us to rely on his. I wanna say that again. He will allow us to face battles we cannot handle in our own strength because it forces us to rely on his. In 2 Corinthians 1.9, it says, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. What a beautifully honest and humble prayer. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Let that be our prayer when the battle comes, Lord. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's enough. So what do we do when the battle comes? We inquire of the Lord, we admit our need. And then number three, we go out to face it. In verse 15, Jehaziel speaks a word from the Lord and he says, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. He tells them to go out to face them tomorrow. And this is, this is very intentional because after hearing you will not have to fight this battle, it could have been very easily assumed that they would have just stay back and continue to pray and the Lord would take care of it. But the Lord tells them to march down against them and go face them. He didn't have to do it this way. He could have taken care of the enemy while they were still in the camp, but he wanted them to have faith. He wanted them to put action behind what they believed. It wasn't because God needed them to do their part in order for him to do his. He can do anything he wants. He is powerful enough to do it without us. But it wasn't for his sake that he asked them to go. It was for theirs. Something happens when we go out to face the battle because our faith is strengthened when it's tested. Our faith is strengthened when it's tested. Can you imagine if your faith never came up against any opposition, how strong would it be? Would you be able to look in the face of an enemy and say, yes, I trust in God no matter what the circumstance, no matter what battle I'm facing. Our faith is strengthened when it's tested. It's so easy to believe that once we give our battle to the Lord that we don't have to do anything. We can just sit and wait for him to work it out and do his thing but the Lord told them they wouldn't have to fight. Not that they wouldn't have to do anything. That's an important distinction. We work in partnership with the Lord. It's not that once we accept Jesus, our our work is done and we're just sitting and waiting till he calls us home. Notice the entire New Testament. There are action words. He says, stand firm, fight the good fight of the faith, endure, put on the armor of God, throw off every chain that hinders. Those are action words. And they are strong action words. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. By his grace and in his strength, we work in partnership with the Lord. He doesn't need us to, we get to. It's for our benefit. So we don't give up. We don't stay back in the camp. We put on our armor. We take our positions. We stand firm. What does this look like? How, how do we go out to face it? Obviously, it was an easy word for them. They were literally going out to face an army. But what does that look like for us? And it will look different for your specific situation. It might be tithing, even when finances are tight. It might be doing your part in addressing a relational or a marital conflict. It could be joining that accountability group. And even if it seems like you're just there saying, there's really nothing I can do, I'm at a loss. There is always one thing you can do. 
And that's our next point. What do we do when the battle comes? Number four, we worship. You didn't think you were gonna get through a whole sermon with a worship pastor and not talk about worship. <laughs> but this is one of the ways that we go out to face it. This is one of the ways we put action to our faith. And this one is my favorite because praise is one facet of worship. It's one way of expressing our worship. And I grew up hearing this story about how they sent the worshipers out first. And it paints such a vivid picture of what happens when we worship. There's so much power in our praise. And here I'm, I'm specifically talking about our praise, the moments that we're bringing him glory and we're exalting him and we're lifting him high. Not necessarily when we're bringing our needs before him, although that does bring him glory. But notice what our passage says. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. He appointed men to praise him for the splendor of his holiness, not what he could do for them. They sang, give thanks to the Lord. They weren't singing, come save us. Come be our help, destroy our enemies. They were singing, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. It was praise. It was thanksgiving before the battle had even been won. And there is power in our praise because it shifts our perspective from our problem to our provider. And there's a place for prayer and intercession. Notice how they did that too. We should always continue in prayer and intercession for the battles that we face. And they also weren't ignoring the problem. They weren't avoiding it and hoping it all just worked out for the best. They moved from prayer and intercession into praise, trusting that he was who he said he was and he would do what he said that he would do. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he is who he says he is and he will do what he says he will do? And maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, well, I don't actually know what he said he would do. And I encourage you, get in the word. Find his promises. There's so, so many. Do a Google search and just begin to declare those promises over your battle, over your situation. Because when we praise him, our problems become smaller. Not because they actually change sizes, but because we have the proper perspective. Yeah. We have the proper perspective. A piece of grass looks huge to an ant until a person is standing on the grass. And notice, the grass never changed sizes. It was always small. But the ant just didn't know it until he saw the person standing. It's the same thing with us. We see our battle and it just looks so big and insurmountable to us. But then we see God and suddenly we realize that really that battle is so small in comparison to how big our God is. They had made a choice to trust in God and praise him in the face of great danger. And I think it's interesting too, God didn't command them to send the worshipers out front. That was something that they chose to do because they had faith. They praised in the midst of the problem, not just when it was resolved, because he is still just as worthy during the problem as he is after it. Our praise and our worship is such a powerful weapon because it builds our faith. If when we worship together on a Sunday morning, these are just songs we're singing, if they're just lyrics we're reciting, then we have missed the point. Our songs help us put words to our prayers. Sometimes when we don't know what to pray, they give us the words to pray. But we have to make them our words. They must be sung from our hearts. When we declare the truth of who God is, it builds our faith. And faith is what wins the battle. So if you're in the middle of a battle right now, have you stopped praising? Turn your focus from your situation to your savior. Praising him in the midst of hardship is like laughing in the face of your enemy. There's a song that I love. It says, I'm dancing on the grave that I once lived in. And you won't ever see me dance because we would all be uncomfortable. And jumping while I sing is, is very, very hard. But I want to. When we sing these songs that we sing, when we worship together, I want to dance. I want to jump because my God is so good and so great. 
And in hard seasons, I literally feel like I'm laughing in the face of the enemy when I worship because he thought he had me, but my God is bigger. He thought he could silence me, but I'm still singing, amen? Amen, we use our praise as our weapon. His tactic is fear and discouragement, but we can praise because we know ultimately our God has already won the victory. I have faith that my God will come through and so I thank him for his victory in advance. Because the reality is we have a hope that will not fail. We have a strength that is not our own. His victory is our promise. Our God is greater than the battle so we can praise him in the midst of it, amen? So as we wrap up this morning, what do we do when the battle comes? We inquire of the Lord, we admit our need, we go out to face it, and we worship. Where are you today? What battle are you facing? It could be fear, anxiety, insecurity, depression, it could be an emotional battle, it could be your marriage, financial struggles, and a health issue, an addiction. Whatever you're facing today, you fill in that blank, For many of you, you don't have to think very hard about what your battle is because you know it's big. It feels like it's looming in front of you. But how are you choosing to respond? Where are you at this morning? Maybe you've been turning to everything but God and you need to inquire of the Lord. Maybe you've been trying to fight in your own strength and you need to admit your need and give it to him. Maybe you're hiding from the battle when God wants you to trust him and go out to face it. Maybe in the midst of your struggle, your faith has taken a hit and you need to remember to worship him in the middle of it again. As we close today, can we stand to our feet and everyone just begin to close your eyes. If any of those resonated with you today, if you're saying, I need to take that step, I'm facing a battle that I can't face on my own, I want us right now to begin to ask the Lord which of those things you need to take with you from today. Which one of those responses that you need to begin to put into action? Do you need to inquire of the Lord? Do you need to admit your need? Do you need to go out to face it? Or you just need to worship? And ultimately, we must surrender it to him because like he said in our story, like he told them, the battle is not yours, it's God's. He's got it. Give it to him. Surrender before him today. So as we begin to pray, just begin in your own words to tell the Lord what your step is going to be. Begin to respond in your own words. Lord, we thank you, God, that the battle belongs to you. Lord, that no matter what battle we face, no matter what we come up against, you are greater and you are stronger and you already have the victory. But Lord, we acknowledge that right now these battles still feel big to us. Lord, we acknowledge that right now we don't know what to do. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for your victory. We thank you that you walk with us through the battle, that we do not need to be discouraged. Lord, for those of us that need to inquire of you today, I pray, Lord, that we would turn to you, that we put aside every other thing that we've run to and that we would run to you that we would inquire of you, that we would ask you for guidance, Lord, and then help us to see your direction when you give it, even in the mundane, even in the normal. Lord, for those of us who need to lay down our pride and admit our need, right now I pray that you would humble us. Lord, I pray that you would remind us once again that it is not our strength but yours. Lord, that you would enable us to lay down the situation, give it to you, Admit our need and let you be strong in our weakness. Lord, if our step is to go out and face it, Lord, I pray that you would give us the next step. Lord, show us what it looks like to go out and face the battle in our situation, Lord, and give us the courage, give us the faith to go and do it, to believe that you are who you said you are and you will do what you said you will do. And Lord, lastly, if there's some of us who have been struggling to have faith, Lord, and we've forgotten to worship you. 
Lord, we're waiting until the battle is done to worship you, but we need to worship you right now in the midst of it and have faith. Lord, I pray that our faith would just rise in this place, that you would remind us how big, how powerful, how great and worthy of praise you are, and that you would help us to worship you. And with your eyes so closed, no matter what battle you're facing in your daily life right now, there is one battle that we all face, and that's the battle with our sin. And it's a battle that we couldn't possibly win in our own strength. There's no way in our power we simply cannot do it. But God sent his son to die on the cross for us, to bridge the gap, to pay the penalty for our sin. And now all we have to do is turn to him, turn away from our sin, and have faith in him as our savior. And then we no longer do it in our own strength. We do it in his. He helps us. He walks with us through the battles. He gives us the strength to turn away from temptations of sin. He forgives us when we don't always get it right because we will not always get it right. Like our passage, the battle is not yours. It's God's. This battle with your sin is not yours. It's his. And he already won it on the cross because he loves you so much. That's my testimony. I was trying to do it all on my own, striving to be a good person, to do the right thing, but inevitably I would fail because we all fail. And none of us are perfect. It says in Romans 3, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There was only one person who could win that battle and he did for you because he loves you. And maybe you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you've never made the decision to follow him and you've been trying to fight the battle on your own. Let me tell you, you'll never win because it's not your battle to fight. It's his. In our own strength, we will always fail. The question is, are you going to fight him or are you going to let him fight for you? The battle belongs to the Lord. So if you haven't fully surrendered your life to him, but today you're saying, yes, that's me. I want to turn to Jesus. I want to turn away from my sin. I need to trust in him. With our eyes closed, would you just raise a hand if that's you? You're saying, I need to turn to Jesus. I need to turn away from my sin. I need to trust that the battle is already won. And if that's you, let's all pray this together. We're going to pray this. You can repeat after me. Lord, thank you for what you've done for me on the cross. Thank you that you won the battle. And then my sin no longer separates me from you. I choose today to turn away from my sin. Forgive me, Lord, and make me more like you. I surrender my life to you. I surrender the battle to you. In Jesus' name, amen.